Welcome to In Focus with Eden Lane. Tonight we go back to the Pikes Peak Writers Conference where we meet writer John Hart. He established his audience quickly with his stunning debut, The King of Lies. And in 2008, he won the Edgar Award for his second novel, Down River. He won the same award in 2010 for The Last Child. And tonight he tells us about his writing process and his latest work, Iron House. So at the Pikes Peak Writers Conference, we have a chance to meet one of the keynote speakers and one of the published authors, John Hart. Thanks for sneaking away from the conference to come up here and visit with us today. Hey, it's quiet, you're beautiful, I'll oh. do this all day long. Uh, when we got to meet at the, the mixer, you were telling us the charming story about how you're moving from your current location to a farm. Tell Absolutely. me about that. Um, it, it's been a, a dream for, uh, of mine forever and, and of my wife and I since we've been together. When I was a boy in North Carolina, a young boy, about 10 years old, my family had 500 acres out on the river. We lived in town, but we wow. had 500 acres on the river, and it was an idyllic childhood experience. I mean, camping, fishing, hunting. We had dirt bikes and horses, and it was just spectacular. And um, my parents divorced when I was 10. The farm was sold, and it's now a junkyard and a trailer park. Mm. And that property had been an intact, pristine piece of uh, property with unchanged boundaries since a land grant from the king in the 1600s. Not to my family, but it's just this pristine, forever ruined wow. piece of property. That's why I'm involved in a lot of land trust organizations. But the net result of that is that I've always wanted to be able to give my children what I lost. Uh, which was the opportunity to grow up on a, a farm like that. Mm -hmm. And my wife, thankfully, shares the same um, aspiration. And so, That makes that easier, doesn't it? Oh, <laughs> so much easier. So we, we found, we've been looking for 10 years, and we finally, uh, A, found the right piece of property, and B, are in a position where we can afford to buy it and afford to uh, live, where, not wherever we like in the terms that we can go live in Monaco, but I'm not tied to an office, I'm not tied to... Uh, a job, I write full time, and I can do that anywhere. Because you stopped practicing law. That's right. I'm a recovering attorney, uh, happily <laughs> self-described recovering attorney, and we move uh, very shortly uh, to Charlottesville, Virginia. That seems to be pretty um, frequent that we see successful writers in your genre having come from the law. Is is there something about that career that? that makes you lean toward writing the way you're doing now? Well, I would say that there are probably two big reasons. Uh, one, being a lawyer is a miserable way to make a living. Uh, <laughs> I did not much care for it. I was a criminal offense attorney. Most of my clients oh. were guilty. Um, in fact, I, the impetus for my quitting to write full time was being uh, given my first child molester to defend. And he was guilty and I was unwilling to take the case. Uh, and that rough and a feathers. court can force you to take the case. Well, I was on they? what they call the court appointed list, which means uh, he was indigent and I was appointed by the court mm -hmm. to defend him. And uh, I met with him in jail. He was very guilty, uh, in my opinion. And I told the judge I didn't want the case. I told my firm I didn't want the case. I had a brand new daughter. My first daughter was m a month old, maybe. And um, they all emphatically said if you're going to be a criminal offense attorney, you, you cannot pick and choose in that manner. And because everyone is entitled to a vigorous of course those are yeah those those arguments are, are the backbone of any justification system but that then a, a human being has to do it and you can't always do that that's right and uh, and honestly I was at a point where I, I was really uh, desperate to try writing full-time I'd written two failed novels one during why do you call them failed novels because they were un I couldn't find an agent or a publisher mm -hmm. um, and you know my goal has always been to be published and to make a living at writing. Um, I mean, I, you can write the most beautiful piece of work and feel uh, warm in your soul about it. And I know that this is not the PC answer, but in my opinion, you got to be published uh, for it to be a successful novel. There's no readers. Novel. Yeah, I mean, it's all about sharing the voice, but even more so for me, it, it's about being able to make a living doing it. I mean, I have That's my wife stays at home, I have children, uh, I'm goal oriented. I, I wanted to make money out of pure imagination, and so that was my ambition. Um, so there was the combination of the fact that I really disliked my job for a lot of reasons. And then I think the other reason that so many lawyers pursue this is um, John Grisham and Scott He's Turow. Kind of set the, that, that sets a tone or a path I, for you, doesn't it? I think he lit a blazing light on the tallest hill around and said, look what you could be doing instead. And I'll never forget it. I mean, he was a big deal. Well, he's still a big deal, but he was really just exploding onto the scene as I was thinking about law school. And then uh, when I was in law school, which was in the early mid-90s, I guess, 
you know, he was five or six books into his career and just on fire. Mm -hmm. And I knew pretty early on I didn't want to be a lawyer. And so I could look at what uh, Mr. Grisham was doing and think, man, that's not bad. Ironically, he lives in Charlottesville. Um, have you met? We've not. Uh, we do have some mutual friends up there, and I hope to meet him at some point. I hear he's a spectacular guy and just, mm -hmm. you know, down to earth and, and real. Uh, so I do hope to meet him. How do you, how did you find your genre? D uh, describe your, your books for uh, viewers who might not be already familiar with them. Okay, uh, I'll try to do it in, in general terms because it's, uh, I don't think that there's one term that I feel comfortable using. Um, I would say that I write um, mystery thrillers with uh, elements of Southern Gothic family drama. Um, so John Grisham and a little, uh, Tennessee Williams stripped together. Yeah, yeah. One, one early reviewer said if John Grisham and Pat Conroy had a love child, this is the, the book he might write. That's, that's probably a better example. Well, and it's interesting. I mean, you know, you, you can't take comparisons too seriously when you're a writer because, uh, you know, reviewers are just looking for something that people can mm -hmm. relate to, and, and it's never an exact comparison. Um, but I, I do get comparisons to uh, people like John Grisham and Scott Turner. I had those a lot early on. In fact, I think the New York Times described the King of Lies as um, Grisham-style intrigue and Tarot-style brooding, or, which was, you know, How did you feel when you read that? Oh, it was great. <laughs> yeah, it was fabulous. Uh, I mean, I admire those guys still, but the challenge for me is that they built the legal thriller genre, and my mm -hmm. first novel was uh, more of a legal thriller. Um, I knew then that I would never out Grisham John Grisham or out Tarot Scott Tarot. They are the masters of it. They own that. Uh, and I didn't want to be forever known as you know, he's the next this or the next that. So I, I decided, I got into an argument with my publishers actually after The King of Lies did so well. Um, they wanted another lawyer book and I refused uh, for that reason. And so Down River, which is my second book, is just much more you know, Southern Gothic, Prodigal Son. Uh, All about the, the angst within a family. Oh, well, more than angst. I mean, it's about bloodshed and betrayal and what happens when a, a father chooses to believe the testimony of his second wife over that of his firstborn son. Uh, the stepmother basically accusing her stepson of having killed someone and seeing him covered in blood on the night in question. And this kid is uh, tried and acquitted and hounded out of town. And, and that book's about what happens when he comes home. So he's really the exact opposite of a lawyer protagonist. You know, mm -hmm. I, I did not want to do another lawyer, so I went to the other side and found a guy that was basically as close as you can be to being an outlaw without actually being an outlaw. Uh, everybody thinks he got away with rich man's justice and got away with this murder. We see that in our culture frequently, where someone is perceived as having gotten away with something and, and how their life can be impacted that way. is is seeing that in the in the news or in the culture what drove you to write that story no uh, not at all um for me it's all about motivation uh -huh. you know i need characters to do exceptional things uh, i don't write about lovely days of shopping at the mall or bridge club parties i write about people in severe conflict and crisis because uh, i believe that the best way to introduce your readers to your characters is to turn up the heat until all the soft, soft bits mm -hmm. sort of cook away and what you see is what's really underneath and who is this person. And that's all about conflict and tension. And uh, you know, I think violence uh, through the crime thriller genre is a great way to explore that. Um, so I need characters to be powerfully motivated. That's about emotion and it's about the past. And you'll find a lot of the past in all of my books. In the case of Down River, for instance, uh, it's about what happened five years earlier when this young man was accused and uh, narrowly acquitted. And it's going back even further to when his mother died 20 years before that under mysterious circumstances. Mm -hmm. And um, so that at the end of the book, the reader can look at the things that this young man has done. And this is a young man filled with feelings of loss and rage and betrayal. They need to be able to look back and say, God, man, I can't believe what he did in this book, but I would have probably done the same thing. So the, the, I don't ever write about social issues. They often find their way into my books. Uh, but I write about what's driving the characters to do whatever exceptional things is going to make the story worth reading. So what is your process like when, when you decide that this is the character you want to write about? Or is it, does it begin with character? How do you always, begin? always begins with the character. My, my process, once you uh, back out the quiet and utter panic, uh, that, that comes from starting a new book. Um, and I do feel that until about page 200. Um, 
That seems to be a common benchmark for writers, page 200. <laughs> it's weird, you know. I, Either good or bad. <laughs> well, I think that uh, those that, that share that trait, I, I think, fall in one camp of writers. I think there are really two styles of novelists. There, there are those that outline, and there are those that grope and hope. And I'm of the grope and hope school, which means I know who my character is, and I may have some vague idea of where I want him to be at the end of the book, but I'm just feeling my way along. And it becomes a, a year-long sustained leap of faith, and that's how I describe it, because wow. no one can stand over my shoulder and say, hey, this is genius, it's going to work, because no one really knows mm -hmm. where I'm going to go. So my process is really beginning with a very strong sense of the main character, and usually two or three powerful emotional drivers. Uh, in and down river, Adam Chase, the young man, was driven by a sense of uh, loss and rage. In The King of Lies, my debut novel, Work Pickens, was driven by guilt and shame. Mm. And then in The Last Child and in Iron House, I mean, you've got other drivers for those characters. Um, Iron that, House is the book you'll be coming back to Colorado for this summer. I hope so, yes. I will be in Colorado in, uh, I think it's late July of this summer. Um, for the release, the book comes out July 12th, and I, I think that's when I'll be here. Um, so really the process is just nailing down in my own mind who this character is, what his issues are, mm -hmm. and then trying to come up with a really exciting plot that allows him to grow, or her, to grow beyond those issues, to incorporate them into some you know, process whereby they emerge at the end of the book in some different form. Maybe they're better off, maybe they're worse off, but they have come to grips with whatever these forces are that drive them. Now that's all twined very deeply in whatever the plot points and the story arc might be. I mean, you got to have a story. People need to feel compelled to turn that page. It has to be something page. to cause you to turn that page. Oh man, it's all about that. You know, I, I love it when I get, um, well, it, it's, this literary is a dangerous word in my mind because literary implies a certain pretension mm -hmm. to me. I mean, people love to talk about the difference between literary fiction and genre fiction. I don't think the line is that clear. I think when people say it's literary work, I think it just means it has a certain depth, that it's not pure plot. I mean, there's, mm -hmm. there's other things that, that are going on there. And that's what I aspire to. I mean, I, I love the, the power of a genre-style plot, meaning you know, it's not necessarily predictable, but there are somewhat recognizable elements that you know, some bad thing has happened. You know, there will be repercussions from this bad act. What will it lead people to do? But the literary element should always be what is the personal growth in the characters you've built that comes from dealing with the repercussions of and that battle. tone and dialogue. Oh, and all of that. All Setting that and, and, oh, and voice. And, and, and I think readers identify literary in the very same way that you described more often than people in the publishing industry might. I, I think that everybody loves labels in the publishing industry. It makes things very easy. You know, mystery, thriller, cozy, uh, literary fiction, mainstream, commercial, whatever. Mm -hmm. It just, it's all about what shelf do you put the book on. And, and that's, that's a, a really artificial distinction that, that's necessary, I'm sure, uh, due to the marketplace considerations. But, you know, at the end of the day, the only question is, how good is the book? I mean, when, when Down River won the Edgar Award for Best Novel, there were five finalists. One was a Pulitzer Prize winner, and one had won the Man Booker Prize, you know, which mm -hmm. is England's most prestigious prize. And I, I beat both of them. So, of course, you were feeling like, well, I'm glad to be there. Well, <laughs> uh, my editor called me when they, they announced the nominees, and he said, congratulations, you've been nominated for another Edgar, but you're not going to win. Oh. But come on up, and let's have a good party. And so <laughs> I went to New York fully expecting to go home empty-handed. But the only reason I tell that story is not to, just to pat myself on the back, although I am proud of it, is to make a point that Everyone was handicapping that contest, saying, oh, these are great literary writers, and of course they're going to win. But at the end of the day, it's not about whether you're literary or genre or thriller or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's about how good is the book and does it work. So as thrilling as that was, um, it, it has to at least live up to the first time you've seen your own book in a bookstore. Oh, let me tell you. I mean, there are some highlights in the path of uh, being published and getting published. There's nothing that compares with the first time you see an actual book. And I don't think non-writers can really understand how powerful that feeling is. They don't understand how much doubt and sweat and work and hope and aspiration went into making that book and taking your shot. And it's a serious validation. I mean, it's, it's just spectacular. Mm -hmm. Um, each book that I've written has outperformed the one before it in terms of the marketplace and, and, and critical acclaim. Um, 
but I, I can honestly say probably the biggest day of my life was not even seeing it in the bookstore that first time, but, but getting it. Uh, you know, I got Having a box of them copy. in the mail uh, a week or two before they went on sale. And it's just this feeling of opening that box and just seeing Hearing the spine crack and oh, seeing your name on that title page. It's nice. I mean, I, I, I have no problem with e-books as long as physical books don't go away completely mm -hmm. because that, it just would not be the same to see a JPEG of your cover art. I mean, it's just not the same. You've, you've touched on the word hope more than once in our conversations before this interview and during the interview. And you're a father and you're moving into a new home, one that you hope to share with your children, that, that kind of lifestyle. As a writer, that has obviously served you to, to be able to bring that, but what are your hopes? What's your hope for your next book and the book after that and, and the legacy you leave your daughters? Wow, that's a big question. Um, so I'll, I'll, I could hold forth for a very long time. I'll try to be brief. Uh, I mean, as a writer, in, in my professional ambitions, my hope is very simple. Uh, I want every book to be better than the ones that came before it. Um, I think that when a writer becomes a uh, major commercial success, the industry looks at it in terms of uh, the writer being as successful as their last book. Mm -hmm. If the last book How sold a million you copies, you know, then this book will, will do the same or maybe a little bit better. Um, I think that's a slightly jaded uh, outlook. I feel I have a contract with the readers so that if they recommend me to friends, if they have bought my books in the past, that they know they can pick up that next book and understand that I took it very seriously when I wrote it and I'm not just uh, phoning it in and, and cashing paychecks. Um, so that's my, my personal ambition is to, to do that and hopefully that will lead to you know, 25 books um, that are just things I can look back and be proud of. Mm -hmm. I don't ever want to feel like I've rushed a book and turned out something subpar. Um, I'm very strict uh, about not letting the publishers push me to deliver a book too quickly uh, and they are very great about that. They understand my process and so we have a very clear understanding. They, they would rather have the best book late than a, a lesser book quickly. Um, of course, I want, they'd rather have the best book on time of course, or early. But. Of course, yeah, yeah. And there, and there are competing factors in the house. Yeah. I mean, the, you know, the sales and marketing people might feel one way and the publisher feels somewhat different. Um, you know, in terms of my children, I've always wanted them to be proud of what I do. Um, I write fairly dark stories, but only so that the traits that I think are important about us as human beings can shine more brightly, mm -hmm. whether it's hope again, love, faith, trust, self-sacrifice, courage, strength, endurance, whatever it is that gets these characters through the novel, I need those things to shine because these are you know, struggling people and maybe that courage isn't uh, heroic, you know, maybe that strength isn't uh, colossal, you know, it, it needs to, to shine in the context of their story. Um, so I, I write dark, I don't want my children to ever think that I'm a dark man or you know a um, someone that just uses you know, graphic devices um, to to sell books and, and my, my books aren't graphic that's really not the right word gratuitous is perhaps mm -hmm. the word um, so I, I think that it's important that they I know they love me I know they trust me I want them to respect me and I can say the same thing about my wife um, the does your books, wife read your books? She does. She's my first great critic. Uh, she reads every chapter when it comes off and she tells me if I'm going off the rails. I trust her implicitly. Um, in fact, the reason that my career works is because my two failed novels were uh, sort of a comic booky approach, mm. meaning, and this is my tongue-in-cheek definition of a comic booky book, you know, if it has uh, one of these things in it, either a ninja, a hovercraft, or an antimatter bomb, it probably has comic booky elements. Um, <laughs> My wife likes uh, Oprah books. You know, I'm not quite that contemplative in my fiction taste, but I feel if I can give enough depth to keep my wife happy and enough action to keep me happy, then I'm walking the line in the right way. And so that's what my books are, and I think that's the reason that they've worked. Um, when do you think you'll let your daughters read your books? Uh, we've already talked about that. Um, not until they're 16, which is going to be kind of tough because the last child is on required reading lists in high schools and many, many places across the country. Uh, Down River's summer reading list. It's a little from, different when it's your daddy. Yeah, oh, ahead. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, mm -mm. I have loads of uh, first editions squirreled away, to get, and I give them all to my nieces and nephews on their 16th birthday. Mm -hmm. Same thing with my children. Um, but, you know, they have incoming freshmen reading uh, Down River at some schools in Chicago and the last child in schools down south, and that to me seems a little young. I mean, I wouldn't want a 13 or 14 year old reading those books, to tell you the truth. Uh, I think 16 seems about right. Um, 
but hey, it, it, it's not my place, I don't guess. I just write them. When you come back in the summer, I'm hoping that you'll, you'll sit down and visit with us again, but can you give me a little, a little preview, a little tease about... Iron House. Iron House. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, as I said earlier, I write about family. I mean, I think it's a very important theme. Uh, when families are involved, cuts are a little deeper, hurts are a little more severe, memory is a timeless thing. You know, family makes everything really rich and potent. I think it, it, it can never be for me the nexus of a story, but it makes a strong backdrop or foundation, however you mm -hmm. want to look at it. Uh, so Iron House is about two young boys who were found half dead, uh, abandoned as infants uh, in a half frozen creek in the backwoods of the North Carolina mountains. Um, one about 10 months old, the other newborn, both of them half dead. They spend the next 10 years of their life in a very hard scrabble orphanage in the North Carolina mountains. The older brother is, is strong. He's emotionally strong, physically strong. The younger brother is just weak and shattered, and he's the subject of terrible abuse at the orphanage from older kids that have marked him out. Uh, so the book begins 23 years ago with these brothers in this orphanage. And what happens one night when something goes terribly wrong and one of the abusers who's been picking on the younger brother uh, is killed in a, in a fairly uh, you know, graphic manner, gruesome manner, he's stabbed in the neck. And the older brother, who is not the responsible party, takes the knife and runs into a snowstorm taking the blame with him. The idea is he knows that his younger brother can't handle the fallout unless he makes it very plain that he's responsible. So he runs off into the storm. Neither brother understand that someone had come that very day to adopt them. A very wealthy woman married to a U.S. Senator had come to bring both boys home. So the setup is the strong brother ends up homeless on the streets of New York and eventually drawn into a life of crime. The younger brother, who's the more fragile, damaged one, goes home with this very wealthy family, but he's absolutely ruined from what he endured uh, as a child at this orphanage. He becomes a very successful children's book author, channeling that pain into his work, uh, but he's really messed up. And what happens uh, 23 years later when the strong brother uh, tries to get out of the life he's found himself in? He's an enforcer for organized crime. He's a very tough guy. And what happens when he wants out? And he's, he's got a pregnant girlfriend who doesn't know what he does for a living. And the mob decides they're going to go after his brother to make him fall in line. So the story moves back to North Carolina where he has to track down his long lost brother and find some way to protect both his uh, pregnant girlfriend and his brother from this threat that has followed him down from New York. And what no one understands is just how dangerous things are in North Carolina from an entirely different front having to do with the uh, senator's wealth and his political machinations and uh, bodies start turning up that have nothing to do uh, with the brother from New York. And my favorite part is that, you know, the senator and all of his people thinks, think that the New York brother is a dishwasher. They have no idea that <laughs> he's like the most feared hit man uh, to come out of the streets of New York in 50 years. That's a lot of texture for a setup. I can't wait to That's read it. That's just a setup. That's all within like the first 40 pages, uh, 40 or 50 pages. Um, I can't wait to read it. Well, thanks. It's, uh, I set out to write a more propulsive book. I mean, I really, I've never written a protagonist with a skill set. All mm -hmm. of my heroes to date were normal people trying to find the strength to deal with abnormal circumstances. Digging deep, finding the, the wherewithal to overcome and to be better and to s survive. I'd never written about a guy who was a badass. Can I say that on television? Yes, you can. Uh, you can bleep me if you have to. Um, but I wanted to write this badass. And so I came up with this character, uh, and I gave him, and again, it's all about motivations, and it's about making him real. So how do you write a Stone Cold killer in a way that readers will care about him? I mean, that's the challenge. You know, this guy, I need my readers to love him by the end of the book, even though he is unapologetic about the fact that he has killed quite a few people. And what happens when he brings that skill set again to his brother's aid 23 years after they left the orphanage? Thank you so much. I can't wait for you to come back with, with your new book. Well, I would be delighted. I hope it works out. Our thanks to John Hart for sitting down with us at the Pikes Peak Writers Conference to tell us all about his brand new book, Iron House. You'll be able to meet him right here at the Tattered Cover on August 1st. You can check our webpage for details. And next week, we're bringing you a one-hour special the Henry Awards by the Colorado Theater Guild. It's a celebration of local theater here in Colorado. Here's a sample of the special evening by the amazing cast of Rent at the Town Hall Arts Center.
us for this special celebration of Colorado theater with full performances and backstage moments, Sunday at 7 p.m. on Colorado Public Television. That's all for this edition. Remember to join us on Facebook and Twitter. With all that Colorado has to offer, we're here to help you keep it in focus. Thanks for watching. Good night. Bug.